In today's video, we're going to talk about a few setups that are better than a one to five risk to reward. And so if that sort of thing interests you, stick around. My name is Steve Spencer. I've been a short-term trader for over 20 years. I'm a partner at a proprietary trading firm in New York City where we teach new and developing traders how to trade stocks, options, and futures. And if you're interested in more in-depth instruction on these types of setups, how we find these setups, and how we trade them, check out the two-hour free workshop where I go into much more depth in detail on these setups. The three setups we're going to look at today were actually the top three things we talked about in our morning meeting. And they all were set up very well off of important price levels, off of strong catalysts for long trades. And so what we do as short-term traders is we, especially on our desk at SMB Capital, we specialize in finding stocks that are called in play. They have strong catalysts, and when a stock has a strong catalyst, that causes large traders and investors to pile in or pile out. And that sort of rush to get into a stock or out of a stock creates the type of price action we need to make very good risk-reward trades. And as far as I know, and I've been doing this for over 20 years now, there is no better way on a consistent basis, month in and month out, year in and year out, to consistently make money trading intraday. Now, this is not the only thing we do on our desk. There's other types of strategies we employ, trading the open, right on the open, right on the close. There are arbitrage, statistical arbitrage strategies we employ. There are international arbitrage strategies we employ. We trade futures, we trade options, we make market plays. There are all sorts of things that we do. But the top traders that we've trained since we started our trading desk have all learned to identify the most in-play stocks and identify how to, how to trade them successfully. And so if you want to be a very successful short-term trader, this is something that you're going to want to master. Now, having said that, it's not the easiest thing to master. And so I've seen many successful traders over the years um, find a little niche away from this. Um, I mentioned a couple of those niches a second ago in the video. But this, these strategies are the most scalable and the most consistent. And they've been around for as long as we've been employing them all the way back to about 2002 when the market had no volatility and we had to find a strategy to find stocks that were moving every day. So that's my spiel on this. Now let's get into the specific setups. Number one, strong catalyst, as I said. How do you find a stock with a strong catalyst? Well, the first thing you do in the pre-market is you find things that are moving, that are up or down or trading volume in the pre-market. We have a scanner for that. SMB scanner helps us quickly sort and find those names. And so instead of having to spend two, two and a half hours of morning prep, like I did 10 years ago with the scanner, I now can prepare in 30 to 45 minutes pretty efficiently, an hour at most if things are really busy during earnings season. Um, so once I've identified the stocks uh, that have strong catalysts, the next thing that I want to do is look at the big picture. How do I look at the big picture? I go from a very short time frame on a chart to a bigger time frame, to a longer time uh, chart, whether that's you know, a two week or one month or sometimes even six months or a year. And that gives me an idea um, two things. Number one, are buyers bigger picture in control of the stock or buy or sellers control bigger picture? And then that's like the really big picture. And then I zoom in on the last couple of weeks right before the, the strong catalyst. And I, and I look, are people getting long the stock or are they getting short the stock? Because if there's a, if there's a catalyst that's either one in the opposite direction of people getting in, that's really important information. Or number two, um, if there's people getting long the stock and the catalyst isn't really that negative, it's a positive catalyst or a neutral catalyst, then I'm looking for those people who jumped in before the catalyst to push it more in that direction. Um, and then once I, well, I've done the big picture analysis, the catalyst analysis, then I want to know once the market opens and I'm in a position, is this trade working? Because we've talked about this many times before. In the first 15 minutes, stocks go up and down, up and down. And you really need to have a price point 
where you've, you can say, hey, this trade is working. They're above this, this, these price levels. They push it above key resistance. The buyers are control. I can set my trailing stops if I haven't set them already when I entered. And I can set my price targets if I, if I haven't set, set the price targets when I initially entered. And I can just kind of sit back, relax, take my hands off the keyboard for that particular trade. Um, and then the final, the final point I wanted to make, which I put in my notes here, is watch our AM meeting. If you want to kind of learn kind of the stocks, the setups that we're looking at and the plays we're making, we usually post the AM meeting once, twice a week on our YouTube page. You can watch that and you'll learn quite a bit. And as I said at the top of the video, the link below the video, if you're watching this on our daily video, there's a link to our workshop. Check it out. I go into a lot of detail on the stock selection process and a couple of the setups we discuss as well. And if you're watching this on YouTube, the links below the video um, will take you to the two hour free workshop. All right, here we go. Three setups. The first one we're looking at, um, and by the way, these, the reason I wanted to talk about all three of these today, you're gonna learn a little something different in each one and I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about each one and understand you can watch the video from the morning meeting as well before any of this happened and you can kind of see how we did in terms of our analysis and our prep versus how the stock's traded. So LLY. The thing that caught my attention, you look at the notes here, we're looking at the big picture chart, we see that it's in an uptrend, we see that it is, was approaching its all time high. Um, and so buyers are in control. By definition, it's in an up, long term uptrend, buyers in control. We identified 90 as potential support on the open. It was gapping above there in the pre-market. When something has good news, and in this case, it wasn't just so much the earnings, the earnings was a small beat. Um, and they raise guidance a little bit. That's not what excited me. The third thing in the notes there is what caught my attention. They're going to IPO their animal health care business. The reason why this is a big deal is you have to put yourself in the minds of the general public, of the retail, of the retail trader, the retail investor, and also hedge funds. The numbers are phenomenal in the United States for, for people and pets. You've probably seen me post some pictures before. I have a basset hound. I like dogs very much. Big animal lover. Um, but the reason why this is important for trading, besides the point that the fact that I like basset hounds, is the amount of money that people spend on pets. I think in the last 10 years, I've gone up some ridiculous amount of money. I went from like a billion dollars to like 10 billion or 50 billion. The numbers are crazy. And I think it's something like 13% of Lily's business. It probably used to be like 1% of their business. And one of the ways that companies um, they can make their stock prices go up. If they have a unit that they can spin off and do an IPO, and then that, that, that thing gets valued independently, that can, call, that can really juice the price of the stock. And so that, that's the thing that caught my attention, not just that it's in a long-term uptrend, and not just that it could potentially um, take out its all-time high, but that, that, was, that was the main thing. And so the lesson here that we get when we drill down into Lily, Lily Trade, there's two things really. Number one, this trade, didn't really trigger until after 10 o'clock. The other two stocks we're gonna talk about, the trades happened very close to the open, one right on the open, one a little bit after. So the thing here is to remember, it doesn't have to always come into your support right on the open. You can see we're looking at the five minute chart here. This didn't happen until after 10 a.m. It went down to 90, I bought I think at 90.06. It popped right away back to 90.80. It came down, did a little retest, a little higher low there, around 90.20. And then like, that was the easy trade. It went down to 90, I bought it at six cents, stops below 89.90, 89.80. And at this point, I, don't, I have no idea if it's gonna really work. It's gotta get back above $91 really. Um, and so, but the easy trade is getting in there at 90. The more difficult trade is actually where I circled it between 11.30 and 12.30. That's where everyone in the chat was like, I'm buying Lily, you know, it's above 80 cents. If it gets above 91, this trade could start to work. But that's the tough one. Look at how long. Short-term traders like things to work quick. Boom, boom, boom. They want to get in. They want the trade to work. Um, they want to be in the money quickly. They want to feel comfortable. This thing is just going up and down, 80 cents to 95, back down to 80, above 91, drops down to 90. Um, not so good. Um, takes a long time. And so I think, you know, a couple of traders probably were even shaken out. Um, if they didn't have their stop below 90.80 or 90.70. Um, and quite frankly, it hadn't even broken out really yet, right? It, had to get, it hadn't gotten above the, the levels right from the open. You really needed to see it get back above 91 um, and then go to the all-time high, which it did in the chart you can see later around two o'clock. But that was, so the example, two things we learned here. Number one, it doesn't have to trigger right on the open. Sometimes it's gonna trigger 10, 10.30, maybe even a little bit later, that's fine. Um, it, it's fine for it to trigger a little bit later. Obviously you want it to move away from that price pretty quickly and either do a retest or a higher low, which it did. 
And then the, the, other, the other thing is, if you didn't get involved at 90 and you were waiting for kind of the buyers to start to take a little bit of control, which they did around 11, 11.30, when it, it got above um, 90.50 and then consolidated at 90.80, is sometimes stocks can meander and not really go, you know, can take 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half before they break. And if you're not the patient type, um, it's gonna be a more difficult trade for you. Um, and obviously when it broke out and finally got above 91, 91 and a quarter, um, it trended for the rest of the day. I think now as we're doing this video, at the end of the day, it's after the close, I think it got to like 93.50 or something. So the initial, by the way, the initial risk, people ask me a lot, we teach this, uh, I think I do this somewhat in the free, in the free two hour workshop as well as our training programs. We do go into a lot more detail on how much to risk on each trade. On this particular trade, I thought it was around a 20 to 30 cent risk based on how, the volatility of the stock. Um, so it ended up being, um, about a, uh, well, about a 10 to one by the, it got above $93 in the afternoon. So better than a five to one, anything better than a five to one is a really good risk reward. That's what we teach the new guys on our desk. The second trade is HOG, H-O-G. Um, this one actually had been a beaten down name. The numbers were very solid. So I like, anytime a stock has been beaten down like this one has, and then has solid numbers, um, and if it's, if it recently has kind of shown support like it did back in May, in early June at 40, and then they, the next time it pulled back, it was being bought higher at like 41, and then coming into earnings, they're buying it a little bit higher. I, I mean, I love that if it gaps down initially with solid numbers on a stock, again, that's beaten down. It's about 25% off the high. So you can see I put the two levels to look at to buy it on the open 42 and 42 and a half. In the morning meeting, again, if you watch the, the few minutes when I talk about the morning meeting, I was like, you got it, you know, if you look for the flush, if it flushed down to 42 on the open, what you want to see in this case is if we have two support levels, it goes down to the second one, you want to see it first get back above the first one, above 42.50, and then hold a little bit higher, hold above 43. At that point, then I'll look for R1 and R2, 44 and 45. Um, let's zoom in. Here's the breakdown on the chart for you. Um, right on the open goes down to S2, um, gets quickly drives back above S1. This was pretty much best case scenario, got to R1 within 10 minutes or so. In this situation, when that happens in the first 15 minutes, I want you to remember, you do not hold this stock. You, you take sales into 44 into $45 because um, even at 43, you could sell a little bit if you're in from 42, maybe 25% of your position. Because in the first 15 minutes, the way it went down and went straight up like that, look at the size of that pullback. That could have kept on going back to the downside. Now our bias was long because it's 25% off the high, the numbers were good, et cetera. Um, but if you're taking sales into 43, 43 and a half, 44, when it comes back down and does the retest of S1, which is exactly where it stopped and went up, that's pretty much where you want it to kind of stop is at S1, um, you're in good shape because you've taken a lot of profits on that initial drive, and then you can pretty much reload entirely and then wait for the trend trade. Generally, trend trades don't happen until after 10 o'clock. And so this was, I mean, this was pretty good. Um, this one, from a risk reward standpoint, you're buying at 42, stops below 41.80, 41.70, 25 cents of risk. This one went up um, on the first time, on the first move, it went up about $2, and then on the retest, went up two and a half. So, $4, 35 cents a risk. This one was actually better than a 10 to one risk reward. So this one was even better than I think Lilly just because it gave you a chance to re-enter um, at S1. But a little bit more complicated, a little bit more experience, a little bit more mentoring to understand this, this sort of kind of how to re-enter. And then finally, Triple M, which was the number one stock we talked about in the morning meeting, um, very different. Oh, and the thing that was different about this from Lilly, the lesson here was if something in the first 15 minutes shoots up um, to your R1, your first price target, um, you want to aggressively sell in the first 15 minutes. And then the final one, Triple M, which was number one from the game plan, was, so you can see I have what, 93 and 94 support. This is kind of based on the, the 30 minute, we'll zoom in and you can kind of see that. Um, a couple of things on the longer term chart we can see. Number one, a year ago is when it first got up to around 192, 193 in the spring of 2017. And then it trended up from there, um, to 260, last quarter, I've circled, that to me was the kind of the important thing. Last quarter, the market was disappointed with the numbers and it went from 220 down to the low 190s, kind of where we had our support for today. Because the numbers were today were okay, and because it was already down 16% for the year, and because last quarter it already got hammered, I didn't see lowered numbers, lowered guidance, it didn't seem like there was enough to take it through last quarter's low, and that's why this was kind of a support play. Could it kind of bounce back up to the top of, or, or near the top of the range from the last couple of months? 
it's a different type of play than, than the Lily in terms of uptrend breaking to the upside, more of can it hold this range from the last couple of months? But still, it's still a long play. Um, and then the other thing is we have 93, 94 support. In the pre-market, it was already below there, which is fine. Um, in that case, what we'll do is we'll look to buy it around the May low, which was around 191 and a half, I think. Um, so I had a script to buy that in from 191 and a half to 191 right on the open with stops below 190 um, for most of it and then below 189.50 or 89.40 for the rest. Um, and then what we needed to see, the thing that was cool about this one was because we had 93 and 94 as support, if we were buying there right on the open at 91, we needed to see it very quickly get above 93, 94 to confirm that it could bounce. And so what happened? Right on the open, my script got hit. I bought some manually as well. Um, and then very quickly, it got to, 90, um, to 93. And so I was pretty quickly about $2 in the money. But you can see those bottom two blue bars. Um, I knew basically, like after I took some profits into that, into that 94, it had to get above there for me to get the trend trade. And I leave the mark, this is the markup from the morning meeting, so you can kind of see what my targets were if the trade is working. And I know, and I cir also circled the area right when I knew it was starting to work. It took a while, like in the first 15 minutes, it was just bopping up and down between like, it retested the low, I think. It went down to 91 again, went back up to 93 and a half, 94. Then it got tight against 94 and had that big green bar at around, looks like 10, 20 or something like that. At that point, it was kind of like, this trade is working now. I can sell some into 96. I can sell some where that second X was for my morning notes into 97.50, which was kind of first real resistance on the, the longer term chart. Um, and then finally, I got flat this into kind of my best case was the top blue line, which I think that was around 202. And I think it did touch that before pulling back a couple of dollars. Um, but this was pretty much different than the other ones in the sense that got hit on a flush right on the open, was kind of below the support area um, bars that I had from. Um, um, from the, the written notes, so it made it a little bit more dangerous. But against 190, a whole number divisible by 10, you're going to look for a lot of institutional orders there. And so this was the most aggressive of all of the three trades, um, was the trickiest, was the most likely that I would get stopped out. But again, this one worked as well. And the risk on this one was about a twenty. I think, was kind of my, if you factor in all my stops together, it was about a twenty of risk. Um, and it did bounce $11. So it still was better than a five to one, even with the scaling out of the position at 94, 95, 96, um, because it got sales up at 201.50 to 202. Um, so again, all three were better than five to one. Some of the couple of them, I think the other two were better than 10 to one. Um, and, you know, it's not, it's not that uncommon. It's, you know, I would say it's unusual for your top three all to work. Usually, you know, even if one out of the three works, you're still probably making money because of the risk reward. If two work, you're having, if two works, you're having a really good day. If all three works, it's probably going to be your best day of the week. But the way I look at it longer term, when I look at the stats over time, if 60% of my trade ideas based on my levels I'm entering um, are going to work, and that's, those are kind of the numbers for me in in-play stuff, very in-play catalyst, 60%. If you say they're independently, statistically, um, those numbers, the trades don't depend on one another, which for the most part they don't. Um, if you multiply that out just from pure statistics, about one out of every 10 three-day period, based on the statistics, a 60% uh, win rate, I'm going to see those. So that's about every, I think that's every two weeks, I'm going to see one of these where three, three work. So it's not that uncommon every couple of weeks, uh, maybe twice a month. Every once in a while you'll get four in a row that work. Um, but you want to just make sure that you have the detailed plans coming in, um, you want to understand before you do the trade how many dollars you're going to risk on that trade. That's part of your detailed plan. You want to understand when is the trade working um, because once it's working, you kind of make sure you have all your price targets and you've moved your stops up to the appropriate areas. And then you want to also coming in, do you have an initial bias? And these, in the case of all three of these, um, I was looking for trades on, uh, on the long side. Um, and the reason the initial bias is important is um, it goes along hand in hand when is the trade working. Um, I'm coming in with a long bias. When does this look better as a long? Can I add to it? Can I put on a second trade, et cetera? Um, I hope you learned something here. Again, all three of these stocks discussed in detail in the morning meeting, um, and so you can review it there as well. And then the process for finding these stocks, finding these setups to our workshop, click on the link, check it out. It's free. Um, I think you'll enjoy it if you enjoyed this video.